Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Sunday night service. So uh, let me try Wednesday night service. And good to have each and every one of you here. Uh, so glad to have you here. We're going to start by singing tonight. And um, my wife was commenting to me, saying, the street sweeper came through and cleaned our street yesterday. And then the wind came last night. And there are leaves everywhere. And most of them are not mine. So anyway, <clears throat> strong south wind last night. Uh, glad to have you here. We're going to start by singing. Uh, Brother Carl's going to lead us in a song. Redeem, number 311. 311. Everybody standing, please, if you can. Redeemed, now I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of the Lord and all. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty. The King in his mighty light. Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps. And giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His child and forever I am. Amen. Let's begin with a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we want to come before you in thanksgiving, knowing that you are the God who cares for us most, and you are the God who cares most. And so we thank you uh, for eternal life. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for a Savior. Who, who loves us, gave himself for us. We thank you for Holy Spirit presence and the acting power of your Holy Spirit that does so many things that we cannot do, including changing our hearts and our lives. And so we pray that we would not look at this, uh, this service as a parentheses or an asterisk in the middle of our week, but help us look at uh, this is a time of great significance, a time where the spiritual battle is joined, where we go to war on our knees and we see victories because we asked you, our Savior and Deliverer, for help. And we pray that we would see your help today and that uh, you would strengthen us in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the message that you have given us to our community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated, but you're going to sing again. Okay, number 345. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have. 
heaven, Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every week. to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, covered with the load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Despise forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. Amen. Thank you, Brother Carl. Okay, I am looking at this here, just going through this. I still have some empty spots here. Um, uh, Jared plans to be here 12 hours. He signed up for so many things here, so if you want to help him, you can. Um, uh, let me make mention of a few things that we might need on Saturday so you know, though. We may need, um, we may need, um, two or three wheelbarrows. Uh, we may need some shovels and some rakes because uh, one of the things that I am going to do is call the Pendleton Ready Mix. Uh, we haven't dropped uh, gravel in the south parking lot probably for about five years. It's time. It, it'll get muddy uh, this winter. And then even after the ramp project was over here, there's still some thin spots. So I'm going to be putting some gravel over here and some gravel over here in this section so that we can take care of that. So it's gonna uh, require a little bit there to do that. And so just uh, letting you know uh, those things taking place here and uh, just kind of going through here and looking, some people have names on here, some people don't. And so, of course, when I don't see your name, then what I do, I pass this around Just look and, and maybe there's a specific thing that you were already thinking about doing and uh, you just weren't here to put your name on the sign-up list. Uh, we will give you this wonderful opportunity to do that again. Uh, we will eat healthy in the morning. That's called coffee and donuts. That'll be about 8.30. Uh, that is a, it's, a, it's a test of your insulin producing system. This is only a test. And uh, we will have that, and I might have some juice and stuff like that. And then we'll have lunch at uh, 12 noon. We're going to take good care of you. And you go, Pastor, what if it rains? I go, who cares? I lived on the west side of the state. I never died of rain, so um, you'll be okay. And uh, it may rain some, it may not. Looks like the morning is going to be better than the afternoon, and so we'll try to kind of focus on the morning there, talk about a few things. Um, so anyway, that's coming up on Saturday. Uh, it really does take everybody to do this, and it's such a blessing when we're all uh, working hard on this. 
Um, Homeschool Association activity is going to be taking place tomorrow afternoon, and that'll be, uh, we'll be meeting here at 2.45 and then going down to, uh, to our field trip location at that. It's going to be on Thursday instead of Friday. Uh, Faith Bible Institute, of course, is on Thursday at 6.30. Registration is open for the next semester. And so just letting you know that, maybe some of you, um, maybe some of you are just sitting back waiting saying, I'll see if they get through the cycle. Well, we're, we're on semester six, we're making it through, and it's going to continue on uh, because we have other people that started at different times. And so uh, Faith Bible Institute will just, as long as there's people uh, who want to learn about the Word of God, we will just keep this thing uh, going. And I'm, I'm beginning, I'm in the embryonic stages on thinking about possibly offering electives uh, to those who have graduated or will graduate. Um, to get an advanced diploma only takes six more credit hours. And six more credit hours is literally, you get six credit hours per semester. And so literally, uh, that is one elective class for three semesters at one hour each. And so it's a little bit lighter, but you still, and so I just have to decide what those electives will be. So I'll, I'll continue uh, to work on that. Uh, a week from tonight is our quarterly business meeting. So just a reminder that that is taking place. And of course, uh, Sunday, uh, uh, Sunday the 31st, a lot going on. We got Bree and Brunch going on. It's anniversary Sunday going on. Uh, we have our quarterly benevolence offering and we have men's preaching. So we have quite a few things uh, that are taking place on that day. Uh, let me talk about this again um, because majority of you didn't know I was going to talk about this on Sunday morning, and that is the need of Guy Bankston's son, Logan. He and his wife are trying desperately and hurriedly uh, to get back to the country of New Zealand. Um, um, Logan is, uh, he either has uh, uh, landed immigrant status or he may even be a citizen. Uh, Guy, Guy, and Debbie Bankston got their citizenship. So they're citizens of New Zealand. And so it's easy for Logan to get in. He, there is paperwork trying to get his wife down there, but there's law changes going on where if they don't get down there in this time frame, the opportunity to go to New Zealand could close for them. And so they're now facing about twenty to $25,000 in moving costs, getting everything down there and getting settled down there. And so um, this next Sunday, I will still be uh, have things open. And if you want to uh, give to them, I just put New Zealand on the tithe envelope, it'll all get there. And um, you know, we don't have to feel like we're shouldering the burden alone. There are other uh, supporting churches that have been asked, but, but whatever we can do to help the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that will be greatly appreciated. So just want you to know that. Uh, and um, just a report, uh, Benjamin is doing well after his surgery. Um, and you go, what kind of surgery did he have? He had, I'm glad it's not me surgery. That's the kind of surgery he had. And, uh, but anyway, he was feeling pretty good after the surgery, uh, but he is going to have to rest up and he is going to be He's going to be down. He's not going to be able to do all the Benjamin things that Benjamin is used to be doing for about six to eight weeks. And so uh, we need to continue to pray uh, for him that he will improve quickly. So remember him in your prayers. Greatly appreciate that. And Brother Carl is going to lead us in another song here. Okay, it's number 106, 106 throughout the lifeline. So I'll stand, please, if you could. Someone is different. 
Turn in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 3. As you were turning there, I'm going to make uh, this statement. Um, former president of the United States that I had a great deal of respect for uh, was uh, President Ronald Reagan. And they called him the great communicator because uh, he had a way of talking to the American people where you didn't wonder what he was saying and he was able to say it in so few words. And um, I still remember when he made the statement where he said, I have observed that those who are for the killing of the unborn have been born. You know, it's a very interesting, st thought-provoking statement. But he also made one other statement, and at that time it surrounded the Cold War and Russia and peace treaties and things like that. And and the press asked him questions, and he just gave one very, very simple statement. And he said this, trust, but verify. And you know, as a general rule, as we go through the time that we're going through, and there are experts, uh, in quotes, I'll put that in air quotes, experts and officials and statements and statistics, um, no, what is my counsel to God's people on this? My counsel is trust but verify. So uh, I did a little, I had uh, one of the church members ask me a question and so I did a little verifying this week and I thought it might be good for you to have some statistics and, um, and I go, why are you saying it on Facebook because I want anybody watching on Facebook. I want you to have these statistics too and understand, I'm only talking about Umatilla County. Um, in Umatilla County, we have had over 14,000 cases of COVID. So I want that number to stick in your head. We've had a little over 14,000 cases of COVID. That probably comes out to be about 17% of the known population. Guarantee you there are more people that had it than that. Some were asymptomatic. Some thought they had a head cold. They didn't know what they had. And, and some just didn't care to tell anybody. But so a little over 14,000 cases. Out of those little over 14,000 cases, 120 cases were reinfections. That means somebody had COVID, and out of 14,000, 120 people were reinfected with COVID and showed symptoms and, 
and this is over 90 days later. So this isn't like a 30-day thing. So, so it was verifiable. So what does that tell you? Well, you can do the math. So what that tells you is that natural immunity is a little over 99% effective in preventing COVID. Okay, that's just math. Little over 120. Now, so here's another statistic. 712 of those 14,000 infections are breakthrough infections. That means they are people who vaccinated and got COVID anyway. Now, the 120 cases is over an 18-month period. The 712 cases is only over a nine-month period. And so at that point, you then know that the vaccines are something like maybe 92% effective. So you would ask the same question I would. Why are those with natural immunity being discriminated against? And my answer to you is, I don't know. But they are. And so just little tidbits of information that I thought that I'd give you right there. So, so go to John chapter 3, looking at verse 16. And uh, we're talking about trust but verify. We're talking about things about the truth. And truth is on trial in this message tonight. John 3.16, which at least I know the first verse, you probably can say without even looking at your Bibles. And that is this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to look carefully and thoughtfully through your word. And though we may rejoice in what we have, your word gives us clarity and understanding why others around us are not rejoicing in what we are rejoicing over. Help us to understand and reach out still in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. About 40 years ago, a sadly successful campaign was waged in our society. And that campaign that was waged was called the removal of absolutes from American society. And it was based on this idea I have a view of truth and you have a view of truth but because we are dismissing absolute truth then my truth can be my truth and your truth can be your truth. And then it is put to the test a majority vote. Which is true. We vote on truth. We vote on what is true and we vote on what is not true.
because absolutes do not exist and absolute moral condition does not exist. So now you can have your truth and I can have my truth and we'll subject it to majority vote. And if eight years ago your truth was the majority vote, then that's the truth. But guess what? If I keep campaigning eight years later, my truth could be the dominant truth and then I win. It's a, it's a close companion to the argument of rhetoric. Whoever wins the argument wins the day. And that is why our society is so poll driven. And that is why our society takes polls of the nation saying, well, do you believe in the legalization of marijuana? Because it's not based on whether marijuana is right or wrong. It's just based on what do you think? And if enough people think marijuana is okay, then voila, poof, marijuana is okay. Okay? By the way, this same argument existed in the early 1980s. Do you believe that homosexuality is a correct lifestyle? 1980s, vast majority of the country would say, not at all. Today, majority of the country says, oh yeah, that's fine. Did truth change? Truth never changed. What happened is maybe your truth changed. Or maybe my truth changed. But there's a problem. There is a God who never changes. And the Bible lists him in Hebrews chapter 13, 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is a God who never changes. And not only is there a God that never changes, God's truth never changes. And it isn't subject to polling, and it isn't subject to voting. In fact, the Bible says this, the Bible says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? By the way, that took place in the 1970s. In the 1970s, there was the God is dead movement. And so did God actually die because they had a movement? Of course not. Okay? Did people not believing in God make God disappear? Of course not. The Bible says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. And so we have, there is a God who never changes. There is a truth that never changes. And that God and that truth is inconvenient in our world today. The title of the message is, and you may have heard this before, but remember, uh, sermons are not copyrighted, so it's called An Inconvenient Truth. Now, I can use that title too, and I just did. And so, An Inconvenient Truth, because we face the reality, and we face that one of the main battles we deal with are with our poll-driven, majority opinion, Facebook, Twitter, um, mob psychology society, is they want to believe that the majority determines the truth and the majority doesn't. Which makes the existence of God in heaven and the existence of God's word and the existence of the gospel very inconvenient indeed. So let me give three points tonight uh, because three is my favorite number when it comes to giving points. Though sometimes on Sundays it could be 5, 7, 10, 12. But on Wednesdays, three is my favorite number. And so let me talk about three very important things and we're going to look in the scripture here. Man desires a God who agrees with his chosen morality. This is one of the things that we're dealing with. This is one of the wrestling matches in today's society. Man desires a God who agrees with his chosen morality morality and you go yes those are terrible people that do not know God that are lost and have never received Christ well I was talking about believers 
it's amazing how many born again believers, people who say they've received Christ, and then when you ask them their opinion of God, you know something is really, really wrong because God agrees with everything that they do. It's a problem there. More so among those who do not know God, but sometimes among those who do know God. Man desires a God who agrees with his chosen morality. Look at John chapter 3, verse 19 again. It says, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and here's the phrase, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Man desires a God of darkness. That's who he desires. Anybody ever heard the concept of a God of darkness? Or maybe the concept of a prince of darkness? Or maybe a concept of the prince of the power of the air? Man desires a God of darkness. He desires a God that has the same moral code that he does. And there's a section of America that desires a LGBTQ God. They want a God of darkness because to not have a God of darkness would to be have a God that would disagree with what they say and with what they believe in. Man desires a God of darkness because as long as there's a God of darkness, as long as there's a God that agrees with me, then that means any pet sin that I have, I get a pass. There's a problem, though. That is not the God of the Bible. And so, if you believe in God, fine, but if you believe in the God of the Bible, you're in trouble here. Because God doesn't give anybody a pass. And here's what happens then. Man desires a God who agrees with his chosen morality he desires a god of darkness he hates a god of light the bible says in john chapter 3 verse 20 it says for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light boy that's fun in public school man you're just a goody and you are intolerant because I am diverse. And so I, being diverse and tolerant, am therefore intolerant of your intolerance. Which makes me intolerant, but that's beside the point. He hates a God of light. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be approved because if we believe in an absolute truth and we believe in a god-given truth then and i once said this when i was going door to door even in my neighborhood i said it's not for god to agree with us it's for us to agree with him but that is a very very hard step for people to say take who prefer a god of darkness and hate a god of of light so because that is the issue and because we deal with that issue in our society and even more so now that truth and morality is subject to debate and subject to a vote and subject to passage in Congress or ruling by the Supreme Court I still remember five years ago when the Supreme Court ruled on marriage and uh, Carl, you, and, uh, you were there, and we were in a Starbucks, and I said, you know, uh, the Supreme Court ruled a couple days ago, and an amazing thing happened. I opened up my Bible, and nothing had changed. And Carl, I don't know if you remember being there, but there were a couple firefighters who were fighting that summer. They went, yeah, that's right! I thought, I like these guys. Wish I had time to talk to them. This brings us to number two. The gospel though true, is an offense to those who want another truth. Look with me, going backwards to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, looking at verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. 
And of course, the light we're talking about here is Jesus Christ being the light. He was in the world. Think of the paradox here. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Stop and just think about that for a moment. Jesus came to the earth he had made. It would be like you living in a house that say, okay, your house was built by George Johnson and Associates. And uh, so you're living in a house that was built by your contractor, which is George Johnson and Associates, and you're living there. And two years later, there's a knock on the door, and you open up the door, and it's George Johnson. It says, hi, just thought I'd come. I just want to pay a visit. I just want to kind of walk around this house that I built. And you'd say, I don't know you. Get out. That is what the world said to Jesus. Jesus, who made, created heaven and earth, and created the earth, came to earth, and walked among men, who said, I don't know you, get out. And it says this, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And when it means his own, he came unto his own creation. He came unto his own chosen people. He, he came unto the children of Israel where Abraham had had a deep sleep and a, and a burning lamp walked through the middle of the parted animals and everything and God made a promise with himself. And of course, one of the things that we know about Jesus, he is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. It says nobody has seen God at any time. So that burning lamp that walked through those pieces of flesh, that was Jesus Christ himself. Just like the rock that followed the children of Israel, that rock was Jesus. He had the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Remember, Jesus is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. So you have that. The gospel, though true, is an offense to those who want another truth. Uh, first of all, it's an offense to those who who want to write their own rules on righteousness. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 3, and um, I made this statement a long time ago as a young pastor, and that is this. Um, man's law ever changes. God's word never changes. By the way, that's an incredibly unpopular thing to say in, in a church of full of, um, of um, Minutemen and government tax protesters. And I had a few in that church. And what I was basically saying is, I mean, I know you're holding up the Constitution as the Bible, and I agree with you, the Constitution is a fabulous document. As long as you remembered that man made it. And man always eventually will change what he did. And, you know, uh, we are, we are um, uh, coming full circle and circling the runway on that one right now. You know, this is the problem we have in the Supreme Court. We've got those that are strict constructionists, and they believe that the Constitution, that the framers of the Constitution actually knew what they were thinking about when they wrote the Constitution. And the others are living, breathing document. And what they're saying is, no, it continues to evolve because we become more and more enlightened. I have another opinion. But here's what we have. If we look at this here, Romans chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Did you catch this? Ignorant of God's righteousness. We have a monstrous amount of ignorance now since absolutes have been cast out of the window and so nobody is looking to a document to be a standard for morality anymore. So we fit, our country fits right into this now. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. 
And you see, because they're going about to establish their own righteousness, that is why you know uh, you can go to school today and they look at the color of your skin and they say, you were born a racist. Because they're going about to establish their own righteousness now and they're coming up with some of the craziest things you ever heard on planet Earth. You know, and you know, if you believe in God, you're a terrorist. What an amazing thing. So, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, here it is, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So we're dealing with that. The gospel, though true, is an offense to those who want another truth. It's an offense to those who want to write their own rules on righteousness. That is also found in the book of Second Book of First Peter, actually, uh, chapter two. I'm going to read just a couple verses here in verses seven and eight, where the Bible says, "Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious." But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of a, the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So, it's an offense to those who want to write their own righteousness and it is foolishness to those who are trying to make up their own enlightened morality. And we find enlightenment, and when you look at this, when you understand their definition of enlightenment, and what their definition of enlightenment means, which means we are enlightened, we don't have to believe in God anymore. We are now enlightened and we develop our own morality the Bible does a very, very good description of describing the enlightened in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness is there an art dealer in the president's family um, maliciousness full of envy murder debate deceit malignity malignity means mono a mono pit one against the other sound familiar whispers we call them leakers today backbiters haters of God despiteful, proud, boasters. The buck stops with me. It's his fault. Inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. It's worse now. Try to even find your parents. This is what our enlightened society is dealing with now with children, they don't even know who their parents are. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, and what that means is people can no longer attach relationally. You know, they've come to a point where uh, they have been hurt so much or they have been cast around so much some children and they just go from house to house to house to house and they don't even have a real mom anymore just five ladies that they called mom for a month at a time dad's no longer in the picture by the way this is our enlightened society this is the product of moral enlightenment when you take God out of it. And it says this, so without natural affection, 
implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They might even develop a special day and have a special parade. The gospel is foolish to those who are making up an enlightened morality. By the way, who was enlightened in the time of Christ? Who was enlightened after Christ rose from the dead? The Roman Empire was the enlightened empire. And the Greeks were the enlightened people. Here's the thing. I've been to Tennessee. And Tennessee used to be called the Bible Belt. But when I went to Tennessee a decade ago, I saw some things and I went, I saw a danger. And the danger had started in the 1800s. And I walked through a former president's home. I think it was Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson's home. And you know, there's all this Greek stuff in the home. And you know, little wallpapered with little, you know, little Greek goddesses with wings flapping around on the wallpaper and everything. And I went to Nashville, Tennessee, where they have rebuilt, they have a replica of the Parthenon which is a Greek structure. And I began to realize that in the 1800s, Tennessee was steeped in Hellenism, steeped in Greek philosophy, steeped in man's enlightenment. And I went, wow, there was trouble in River City way back then. And so here we are in the Roman Empire. Look with me at Acts chapter 26. And you're dealing with Paul talking to government officials attempting to witness to the enlightened. Acts chapter 26, looking at verse 22. And so he's speaking, he says, Having therefore obtained the help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things, than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And once he was done saying that, one Gentile erupted. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. What was he saying in political speak? He's saying, Paul, you are foolish. And you've taken leave of your senses. Why would you believe something like the gospel of Jesus Christ? Man desires a God who agrees with his chosen morality. The gospel, though true, is an offense to those who want another truth. So what should we do? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking in verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God third point we must continue to throw out the gospel lifeline to those who reach the end of themselves we need to do it we need to continue to fling it we need to continue to toss it in this storm-tossed world of bubbling ideas and conflict.
conflicting moralities and a lack of absolutes. There needs to be a life preserver thrown out into the cauldron so somebody can be pulled to shore. Because you see, people have to come to the end of themselves. For those who are creating their own righteousness, there has to be the end of the legalists. Where the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know what's so hilarious? The law of God was created to bring people to the end of themselves. The law was the schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. The law, the purpose of the law was to put a set of demands on mankind, a standard of righteousness where man would come to an awareness, I can't do this, I need something else. And God says, you're right, you do need something else, you need a savior. It was meant to bring man to the end of himself. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And we must continue to throw the gospel lifeline because even now, while I speak, there are people in Pendleton that are coming to the end of themselves. Who are they? I don't know. But I hope we find them in time. And then not only that, the end of the enlightened or the end of the elitist. Still looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but reading just a little bit farther. Starting in verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I love the word confound. The word confounded is, I don't get it. How does that work? How is that possible? Confound the wise, chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. And what it is, is there are people, there are legalists that are coming to the end of their rules. And there are enlightened people that are coming to the end of their enlightenment. And they're realizing the pointlessness of it all. And they're realizing the emptiness of it all. And it doesn't matter what the boast is. It doesn't matter what the plating seems. They're coming to the end of it. And they're going, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. And you're full and you're fulfilled. And I'm right. And I'm empty. And miserable. And there comes a point when people come to the end that they begin to listen. They may not tell you, but they listen. They might not tell you they're watching, but they're watching. Boy, for those of you in public school, I'll tell you what, they have you under a microscope. They're watching. Man desires a God who agrees with his chosen morality. It's not going to be the answer for him, though. The gospel, though true, is an offense to those who want another truth. It's an inconvenient truth. But we must continue because there are those that even right now are coming to the end of themselves. Verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, God's made unto us wisdom. God's enlightenment and righteousness. God's righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord. Man wants credit for everything he does. 
But there's only one who deserves credit. And that is God. He deserves the credit. For everything we are, everything we do, God deserves the credit. It is the hope of the gospel truth. And that is the truth that our world needs so much. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we've looked into your word, it is so easy to believe the intimidation of the roaring lion. I've discovered that sometimes people that are right yell loudly, but people that are wrong yell louder yet. And in all the shouting, it doesn't make them right. And the shouting doesn't help them. They need the truth. And Lord, you have said that a soft answer turneth away wrath. I know that Elijah wasn't really listening to you until he heard the still, small voice. It wasn't the fire, it wasn't the earthquake, it wasn't the wind. It was in the quietness. I pray, Lord, help us in the quietness to reach people for you. We pray for your help because... In their minds, your truth seems inconvenient. But it's the only truth that can save them. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, the song is number 155. Let's sing this song together. It's just a simple song, but it's saying we're God's vessels. The Bible says the church is a pillar and ground of truth. There is no other location where people are going to get it. We're it. If we don't get it outside these four doors, it'll never happen. Let's stand 155. Let us sing the song. Have thine own Shall see Christ.
strongly on. 